Good afternoon. Welcome to Grand Rounds. Um, <clears throat> today we're going to have a presentation on electrophysiology by Wendy Zhao. Uh, Wendy did her undergraduate at Ohio State, uh, oh, sorry, at The Ohio State University. Uh, graduated summa cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. She did her MD degree at Hopkins, medicine residency at the University of Wisconsin, and then did a research fellowship, a cardiology fellowship, and an EP fellowship at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, which I, I believe is the major uh, EP program in the country. She joined the faculty at Penn after, the, after her training, but only stayed there a year and then moved to Denver. Uh, after that. She's currently an associate professor and director of electrophysiology. Uh, she's been on a number of uh, editorial boards uh, for electrophysiology journals, and she's currently the senior associate editor for circulation, uh, the, the arrhythmia and electrophysiology <clears throat> uh, journal of that group. Uh, she's been listed as a top doc in electrophysiology in U.S. News and World Report, and also uh, 5280. And uh, we're going to hear some new advances uh, in arrhythmia management. If you have questions, uh, please put them in the Q&A box. And uh, Dr. Zhao, take it away, please. Thanks very much for the introduction, and thanks especially for the opportunity to share what we do here, uh, not just here, but uh, with colleagues around the country and around the world <laughs> in cardiac electrophysiology. Um, I'm gonna focus mostly on ablation uh, management in terms of complex arrhythmias because there's so much to cover just in that area alone. Um, these are my disclosures. We'll start with the case. So this is an audience uh, participation case. Uh, so, uh, think that there's a capacity to put in a poll and answer questions after I post the question. So 54 year old man with hypertension presenting for a routine physical exam. He's on, you know, pretty reasonable reg medical regimen and his vitals look okay on initial assessment. This uh, patient assessed in residence clinic, the astute resident who was examining the patient noticed that on heart, on the cardiac exam, although the rate was regular, was within normal limits, the, the heart rate itself was irregularly irregular. And this prompted an ECG then to be acquired, which shows what you can see here. And this is not fib flutter. This is just atrial fibrillation. Um, the, this was a surprise because, you know, this patient wasn't known to have atrial fibrillation. So the, the resident asked, can you tell that you're in an arrhythmia? The patient, not knowing what that might feel like, says no. So uh, what should be done regarding management of atrial fibrillation in this patient? A, nothing. He's already on appropriate meds. B, initiate oral anticoagulation. C, initiate a beta blocker and oral anticoagulation. Or D, initiate an anticoagulant, antiarrhythmic drug, consider for DC cardioversion and potential referral to the electrophysiology group. Can we put those in a poll so that people can respond? If the answer is no, I'll keep going. I'm sorry, we had to have those preloaded. Oh, okay, got it. Well, you all in your minds, uh, think about what you would have done in this scenario. Um, I'm an electrophysiologist and I've, this is probably a loaded question for me to ask, but I think that the appropriate answer in this situation is answer D. And um, I think what led people that might have answered A, B, a or B potentially, I, I'm not sure if many people have answered C, is that you know the concept is that the patient is rate controlled. He doesn't have any evidence for systolic dysfunction or any evidence for symptoms. But the way in which you ask this question uh, can really color actually what uh, you, you glean in terms of symptoms from a patient. Atrial fibrillation is truly a global problem. In 2017 alone, there were 3 million new cases diagnosed around the world, and this is based on the Global Burden of Disease study. Um, when you consider that the global population is 7.7 .7 billion or more now, uh, that's, that's not an insignificant number. And if you actually look at the worldwide prevalence, 
between 1990 and 2017, so just under 30 years, there was a near doubling in terms of the worldwide prevalence. And there's uh, significant associated morbidity, mortality, as well as healthcare costs associated with treatment of atrial fibrillation. So what is it exactly? And we hear the term a lot. I'm not sure that people fully understand what it is. Um, in the beginning stages of atrial fibrillation, well, let's back up and start with what normal is. So normal sinus rhythm means that this area here of the heart, it's a cluster that is specifically called pacemaker cells. These cells emanate impulses electrically that then get sent out to all of the cells in the atria first. The cells respond by then contracting. So then the, the chambers contract. That information is then sent down through the AV node, down the his Purkinje system, which I like to term the highway of the heart, to then um, activate then the ventricles in a kind of uniform and more rapid fashion than would occur if cell-to-cell -cell conduction occurred along. And so that's normal. All of the other cells in the heart can activate uh, no matter where the impulse comes from. So if you have PACs, for instance, which many people who in the paroxysmal stages of atrial fibrillation have, so that's firing from somewhere in the atrium, actually causes premature complexes to, to then happen. And, and at first, these may present just as single PACs. Over time, they may start to cluster together to form runs that we call SVT or paroxysmal atrial tachycardia. And in the susceptible individual, this repetitive firing, which usually is from the pulmonary veins, can lead to this electrical disturbance, truly an electrical storm, sort of like lighting a match and starting a fire. And in this scenario, all of the atrial cells are misbehaving. So there's electrical activation coming from all areas of the atria. No one's listening to one another. No one's working together. And the atria effectively are fibrillating. Um, that can, we'll discuss later, then lead to the increased stroke risk that is associated with atrial fibrillation. The AV node and the highway system attached to it does function as a relative filter. So it doesn't let all of the impulses from the top get to the bottom, or else there would be a lot of people who have atrial fibrillation who would not be alive. Um, but what can still happen is very chaotic activity. And that's the activity that patients, you know, develop symptoms from because the ventricles are rapidly and irregularly beating, uh, which can produce um, the most common symptoms, which we'll discuss in a moment. Um, once a person has had enough episodes of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, meaning they're in and out of it on their own, they start to, the cells actually start to perturb uh, in function more than just electrically. So they actually start to produce fibrotic tissue and that fibrotic tissue can lead to chamber enlargement and make it much easier not only to have AFib be triggered, but for it to sustain. And as this cycle progresses without interruption, there is a threshold within which then multiple triggers form from other places and complex flutters that can utilize the scar tissue or fibrotic tissue that has been formed then can form and it becomes much more difficult to control atrial fibrillation and to restore sinus rhythm in this context. Not impossible, but just harder, harder than in the paroxysmal phase. Without interruption, if a person is allowed to have this happen for years to decades, everyone's timeline is a little different, then permanent atrial fibrillation then is what is accepted. Meaning as long as we can control the heart rate and protect against stroke, that's what we accept because the threshold of um, effort that is needed in order to restore sinus rhythm in these patients, the benefit no longer outweighs the risk many times in those situations. Now I mentioned symptoms. Many times when you ask a patient, can you tell that you're an AFib? What do you think they're thinking? They're not thinking, oh yes, I can tell that I feel more short of breath, more fatigued and exercise intolerant than I used to. No, no, they're, they're focusing on whether or not they sense any symptoms in the chest. And many times they don't. Many times people who have AFib don't have palpitations and don't have chest discomfort. More predominantly, they actually have these other more insidious symptoms that can be attributable to something else like getting older, being out of shape, having COVID, having long COVID, what have you. So that's an important factor in terms of screening patients that should be treated more aggressively. Common comorbidities with atrial fibrillation include the following, and it is increasingly recognized, especially over the last decade, that these two on the top, obesity and obstructive sleep apnea, are not only co-associated with atrial fibrillation, but they are actually very important to control. Um, if you encounter a patient who has atrial fibrillation and these two other things, or one of the other two things, and you sort of ignore those things, you're doing the patient a disservice because data has shown that if you control these two things, you can actually 
uh, improve AF control as well as improve response to treatments. Major health risks associated with atrial fibrillation include stroke, as well as development of heart failure. If you think about it, many patients who have AFib have rapid heart rates. The heart is just like any other muscle. It can get weak if it works too hard for too long. And so that's where the etiology of heart failure typically results. And other cardiovascular events, all of which can culminate to decreased survival. And there absolutely is a survival impact associated with having or developing atrial fibrillation. This is old now, but good data from the Framingham Heart Study, which shows the impact of development of atrial fibrillation over time. You can see that those patients that developed atrial fibrillation had an almost twofold, as much as twofold increased risk of death compared to those who did not develop atrial fibrillation. And so really, you know, because you'll notice that that study was reported in the 1990s. So a lot of the treatment that was centered around that time really focused on what the treatments were that were available at that time to try to reduce morbidity and mortality. And that really centered around stroke prevention, primarily with medication, primarily with warfarin or exclusively with warfarin even then and heart rate control to prevent heart failure. And another way to affect heart rate control that was you know, the most definitive would be to perform an ablation to basically ob obliterate the AV node communication point, such that you know, we could affect very effective rate control, make a person dependent on a device and implant that device, a pacemaker, you know, to try to make sure that they had a backup rhythm. And, and that was you know, a, a very accepted way with which to manage atrial fibrillation. In fact, in, in many places, it still is. Heart rhythm control at that time was really limited to medications. And towards the latter half of that era, I would say that you know, that was mostly amiodarone, uh, which in and of itself has its own toxicities. Now, um, data stemming from that time period in terms of which is better, rate control, rhythm control, really cumulatively evolved this concept and the subsequent practice that still persists, which I hope changes, that rate control is equal to rhythm control. If you have AFib, no biggie, let's just control the rate, make sure that you are protected from stroke. And that's at least as good as submitting you to some rhythm control uh, strategy. So these are very well respected, very well done journals, as well as randomized control trials from which this practice sort of evolved. Most of these patients had persistent atrial fibrillation. A few of them also had heart failure. What they really showed though, is not that rate control is equivalent to rhythm control in managing patients with atrial fibrillation. It is actually that rate control is equivalent to rhythm control when you only use medications for rhythm control and predominantly use amiodarone. Uh, so, you know, things have evolved, which I'll talk about in a moment, that make us less reliant on needing to use those medications. When you look at the protocol for rate control versus rhythm control in one of these studies, for instance, you can see why if all you want to do is like control the heart rate and start a blood thinner rather than subject someone to multiple cardioversions and trials of antiarrhythmic drugs that may or may not be effective, that the rate control strategy does seem, you know, a lot more appealing. Now, I think the trial that I really want to focus on, because I think that's what people focus on a lot when they practice clinically in terms of deciding whether or not to be more aggressive, usually not that aggressive in terms of managing patients with atrial fibrillation is this one. So this is the AFFIRM trial. So atrial fibrillation follow-up investigation of rhythm management was a multi-center randomized controlled trial, uh, randomizing just over 4,000 patients to treatment with rate control or rhythm control. This is a mix of both persistent as well as paroxysmal atrial fibrillation patients. The baseline stroke risk that would have been predicted in this population was much higher actually than the actual stroke rate that occurred. So that these patients had a CHAD score of at least two, which would have predicted a stroke rate of at least 5% per year. So lower stroke rate than predicted, that's one. When people look at the results of this trial, they focus on this Kaplan-Meier curve and just the curve alone, which showed that in fact, there was no significant difference, no significant difference in mortality between rhythm control and rate control, but that there actually tended to be an increased rate of events, mortality events in the rhythm control group. Maybe you only needed a few more and it actually would have reached statistical significance. And so from this then propagated this concept that, oh, you know what? We don't need to worry about controlling the rhythm. Let's just, let's just make sure people are rate controlled. If you look at the actual data though, so one um, kind of caveat to this is that people who were randomized to the rhythm control arm 
you know, there's a belief that, oh, we're starting rhythm control therapy, therefore that should control the AFib. We now know that that's kind of a fallacy. Like there's, there's no actually curative therapy for atrial fibrillation, especially antiarrhythmic drugs. So if you assume that just because someone got randomized to that arm, that they're not going to have AFib and you stop their anticoagulation, guess what? They're going to have AFib and they're going to have strokes because that's exactly what happened to in that group to a greater degree than in the rate control group. More patients were taken off warfarin or were allowed to have INRs that were less stringently monitored. And in the on-treatment analysis that followed, which is of course, never the way that you're supposed to uh, philosophically, uh, stringently interrogate um, or assess randomized controlled trials, but it still provides meaningful guidance. In on-treatment analysis, it was those patients who maintained sinus rhythm that had increased survival actually. And that includes in the rate control arm because not all of those patients were persistently in atrial fibrillation at the time, but more of those patients were anticoagulated. Warfarin also was independently associated with increased survival. Antiarrhythmic drugs independently associated with increased mortality. And I'll remind you that the primary antiarrhythmic drug that was used was amiodarone. So fast forward a few decades, and we've had a fair number of advancements in terms of treatments for stroke prevention, as well as heart rhythm control with respect to atrial fibrillation that has really expanded our capacity to reduce morbidity and mortality in this population. We actually have personalized ways to assess these types of treatments in different patients with different medications, with complex ablation in particular, with uh, modified or advanced device implantation. And we still do have the fallback of what we had before in terms of medications, as well as AV node ablation and pacemaker implantation. So along the line of stroke prevention without the need for continued anticoagulation, um, the, the whole concept for uh, clot formation, stroke occurrence in patients with atrial fibrillation is I mentioned that these chambers, the atria are fibrillating. The left atrial appendage, which you can see here, is uh, what I term sort of the appendix of the heart. It was useful maybe when we were developing in the womb, but it becomes not only not useful, but problematic um, when, as soon as we're born. Um, it can harbor triggers for atrial fibrillation, but more importantly, it is the usual place where clots can form when pa patients go into atrial fibrillation, and especially if they're not anticoagulated. So the concept behind these types of left atrial appendage occlusion devices is if we block it off, if we completely shut it off entirely, yes, clots can still form in there, but they can't go anywhere. And remember that a big clot that, that can embolize one of the first shots out of the heart, one of the first organs that's perfused is the brain. And so that's where the stroke risk comes from. So you can reduce the stroke, stroke risk. It's been shown, um, and this is data using the, the device that's been out on the market the longest um, with respect to left atrial appendage closure, which is the Watchman device, at least with FDA approval. Um, so equivalent outcomes in terms of prevention of recurrent ischemic stroke, but far superior in terms of prevention of hemorrhagic stroke. And so this then allows us to offer this type of treatment for patients, for instance, who are at both high risk of bleeding as well as at high risk for ischemic stroke. These are the devices that are either in clinical use or in study that are available. These three are the ones that have been clinically available here, Amulet being the newest, um, just FDA approved for this purpose in August. And um, so, Patients at high risk of bleeding who also have high risk of stroke, this is a potential option. Also a potential option, um, a less direct way at potentially addressing the stroke issue, but more direct in terms of rhythm control is this whole concept of ablation. Now this cartoon is from the very first ablation that was performed to treat atrial fibrillation. And this was an AV node ablation. It became recognized as we were doing more and more electrophysiologic studies, putting catheters on the inside of the heart, recording electrical information, that we might be able to use those same electrodes to deliver energy to the heart, to actually provide targeted damage or ablation uh, to the region that was problematic. And so in this case, this patient with very refractory to control rates in atrial fibrillation underwent AV node ablation successfully here. And you can see that what it's hooked up to is a generator from a DC cardioverter. So you know, uh, things have evolved since then. Not too uh, long after that first ablation performed with the AV node, VT ablation was similarly employed using the same technique. Now, the key thing here is that up until this point, the treatment, you know, in terms of even just uh, getting rid of AV node conduction was surgical. 
So you had to commit these patients to an open heart surgery with an associated mortality of as high as 10%. So not insignificant. So the capacity to be able to do this without the need for surgery really started a huge revolution in terms of arrhythmia management. And with the subsequent advent of radiofrequency energy, as the energy source, it's, it's uh, basically electric current that's of a similar frequency to cautery used in surgery. Um, so using that as a means to deliver ablation energy, as well as development of these electroanatomic mapping systems, which I'll show you in a little bit, uh, the ability to widen this therapy and deliver it in a much more efficient and safe manner to a larger number of patients has really, really uh, tilted the change change the way in which we practice, and I hope it continues to do so. This concept of firing from the pulmonary veins, triggering atrial fibrillation in the vast majority of people, came from this group here, Michelle Hassegger and the group at Bordeaux were the first to study by putting catheters inside the heart, inside the left atrium, inside the pulmonary veins. And what they could see is with the surface here, initiation of atrial fibrillation, repeatedly they saw that there was firing from the pulmonary veins, um, sometimes from multiple pulmonary veins, sometimes just from one that would reliably trigger atrial fibrillation. And it became then recognized that we could actually treat this somehow with ablation, not ablation of the AV node, but ablation with a means to kind of contain these triggering areas. And in subsequent study, using this technique in patients with paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, again, the easier to control AFib because less remodeling has occurred, this was consistently shown to be effective with 77% freedom from recurrent atrial fibrillation in, in the majority of studies. Now, it took a long time, you know, for this to become an accepted treatment, and in part because it took a long time to be able to perform and complete a randomized control trial looking at ablation versus medicines for first-time therapy of patients with atrial fibrillation. But this feat was finally um, ultimately, ultimately completed and accomplished in 2017. Uh, this is the Cabana trial reported in JAMA in 2019, but we all knew about the results before the actual publication come out, came out. Um, this was a wide variety of patients with atrial fibrillation from paroxysmal to persistent to long-standing persistent, not quite permanent technically, but you know, much harder to control substrate. 126 centers in 10 countries, including the University of Colorado was an enrolling site. Ryan Alleyong, one of my colleagues, was the site PI for this study. More than 2,200 patients were enrolled, randomized to either catheter ablation or drug therapy. What is clear, or what became very clear from this study is several things. One, there isn't really a curative therapy for atrial fibrillation right now. However, if you're gonna pick a therapy, catheter ablation is the way to go if you want effective AF control compared to drug therapy. Note too that there was a tremendous and dis disproportionate crossover from the drug arm to the ablation arm, not the other way around, that then led to a initially disappointing finding in terms of the intention to treat analysis that you can see that the catheter ablation um, intention to treat arm did significantly better in terms of occurrence of the primary outcome, a combination of death, disabling stroke, serious bleeding, and cardiac arrest compared to drug therapy. But in the intention to treat analysis, it wasn't significant. But when you looked at what therapies the patients actually got, those patients that got catheter ablation compared to drug therapy did do significantly better in hard outcomes, not just um, re recurrence of atrial fibrillation or control of symptoms. Fast forward even a couple of more years, a group in Germany conducted this uh, East AF net for trial investigators. It conducted this study of early rhythm control therapy in patients with atrial fibrillation. In other words, why wait until patients are kind of locked into atrial fibrillation before we think about doing something or just target the patients that have symptoms only? Um, so this was more than uh, 2,700 patients enrolled in multiple countries, primarily in Europe. Uh, AF diagnosis made within a year of enrollment, and they were randomized to either early rhythm control or usual care, so rate control and anticoagulation. You'll note the early rhythm control was predominantly with antiarrhythmic drug medications, but 8% actually went to catheter ablation as the first line therapy. And in the primary outcome, despite the fact that there were, you know, kind of a mix of approaches that were used, the key was that those patients in whom rhythm control was instituted early on in the, the disease process did better in terms of cardiovascular death, stroke, as well as hospitalization for heart failure decompensation or acute coronary syndrome. 
significantly better than usual care. What I also found notable is that the stroke rate was actually one and a half times higher with the usual care treatment compared to early rhythm control. And presumably all of these patients were adequately anticoagulated, which then begs the question, it's a question that's begged, it's not an answer, begs the question about whether or not, you know, there's some other stroke protective effect of keeping people in regular rhythm or sinus rhythm more than um, just anticoagulating. And then the impact of catheter ablation in heart failure has actually been out there for an even longer period of time where there actually is definitive difference in mortality that is affected. Uh, one of the first trials was the ATAC study, which randomized patients with heart failure to catheter ablation versus amiodarone. Clearly those patients who underwent ablation did better, not, in terms of, not just in terms of uh, recurrence of atrial arrhythmias, but in survival. So 55% relative risk reduction in all-cause mortality with the ablation arm. And then Castle AF, uh, which also showed that over time, patients who underwent ablation had significantly better survival than those patients who, had, who underwent medical therapy. So potentially a life-saving procedure, but especially in patients with heart failure. So um, early intervention though, I think is a key to success, which is the theme in these more contemporary um, frontier ablation trials. I think the similar pattern has been shown for treatment of ventricular arrhythmias in that earlier intervention is actually important in terms of success. So it used to be, so the, the first uh, defibrillator that was implanted in man was by Michelle Morawski here at the Johns Hopkins Hospital. They, he, in, in conjunction with Morton Mower, uh, developed the first defibrillator system. Had to be surgically implanted, but this is, you know, many evolutions of this device have developed uh, to make it a completely transvenous system. Now, these defibrillators are key in terms of preventing um, or treating ventricular arrhythmias when they happen, but they don't prevent the ventricular arrhythmias from happening. And as it turns out, actually, if you get shocked from your device at, for VT, you actually have lower survival too, beyond just the, the indication for having the ICD. So what has evolved is this dependence on use of antiarrhythmic drugs concomitantly to help to control ventricular arrhythmias. And you know, increasingly, not just increasingly, the predominant antiarrhythmic drug that has been used is really amiodarone. With the recognition that, you know, most people who have ventricular heart disease um, and arrhythmias have scar tissue in the heart, if we can identify where that scar tissue is, as uh, is shown in this case, he was had a, this is a patient who underwent transplant, and you can see it's a patient who had a prior infarction, these white areas of scar tissue, um, you'll see that it's not all dense scar that, that is here. There's some surviving myocytes that are kind of intermixed with these um, abnormal scar cells that are, are functionally not, not functional. So they can't conduct anymore, but these fibers can. And you could imagine all sorts of different pathways of reentry that could happen, little circuits of arrhythmias that can form and then lead to then ventricular arrhythmias that happen in these types of of patients. So the same concept with ablation therapy applied in the atrium to kind of contain an arrhythmia can be applied to the ventricle. So we can actually apply such energy to these regions of abnormality, kind of get rid of as many conducting channels within this abnormal tissue as we can, and then affect appropriate control, uh, a, a better control over ventricular arrhythmias than just medications alone. Um, this is work that kind of highlights how this is something that is truly a team effort not just Team University of Colorado, but in this case, you know, this is a number of years ago, our center in the University of Pennsylvania, we got, came together to implement this strategy of ablation to control ventricular arrhythmias and found that there was a significant improvement in, to, in terms of our ability to affect control when we, need, when we use this, this kind of approach. A number of other centers have uh, implemented similar strategies to show similar results, but but you'll say these are not randomized trials. Well, there have been multiplied randomized trials of early VT ablation even in patients with ischemic heart disease. And all of them have shown that VT ablation compared to usual therapy actually leads to an improvement in terms of VT burden afterwards with decreased burden of shocks up to with a decrease ranging from anywhere from 38 to 65%. So it's an effective treatment. Now, what has been 
somewhat frustrating is that we haven't been able to see the same uh, mortality benefit for treatment of ventricular arrhythmias with ablation as we've seen for atrial arrhythmias. But, but certainly, you know, the, the goal of reducing subsequent ventricular arrhythmias in these patients has been achieved. And um, I think there's more to come on whether or not more uniform strategies for ablation may lead to um, more uniform signs of success. So how exactly do we perform catheter ablation? So you all are invited to visit the EP lab anytime. I know people think of it as like this place that's a dark room, a black box or something. You're all invited in. It's really exciting stuff happening in there. This is an example of the shot or a view from the main procedural area from our control room and the equipment that is involved in doing an ablation, the equipment as well as the personnel. So there's the patient on the fluoroscopy table, EP physician, we have an anesthesia team working with us in the vast majority of these cases, a team of EP trained RNs and technicians. We have fluoroscopy, we have our tools that allow us to see signals in the heart. This is that electroanatomic mapping system that I was describing earlier on. We're basically using catheters that are positioned in the heart we can determine the three-dimensional location of them within a magnetic field and also see the electrical signals that are recorded at each of those locations. Pretty amazing stuff. An intracardiac echo. So this is a catheter with an echo probe in it that we've placed in the right atrium. So looking from the right to the left atrium, we can perform transeptal puncture. We can actually, in one of the mapping systems, actually utilize the ultrasound images that we have from within the heart and actually in, it, take slices of those contours of those images and actually incorporate them into the three-dimensional map that we're recreating of the heart. Pretty cool stuff. Uh, these are the types of mapping catheters that we use as well as ablation catheters. And in this case, these are radio frequency ablation catheters that have the ability to sense um, contact with tissue uh, as well as proximity to tissue. And so functionally, so this is an example of a patient who has atrial fibrillation. You can see that if you look at all the information on the screen, this patient's in AFib. We are mapping out the heart, mostly to obtain the geometry, but we can get electrical information while we're doing that. We have our intracardiac echo here. We can do that. And then we create the geometry. We can, you can see here, start ablating. And we can see without even like directly visualizing the heart itself, like it, it's actually in some ways, better visualization of the inside of the heart than even the surgeons can have because we can see what's happening electrically as well. And we can also do this in the ventricle. Whatever chamber we want to map, we can map with this contemporary technology and we can ablate. Now, I mentioned that the primary source that we use is radio frequency. There are a number of tools that have been developed to try to deliver radio frequency and various con con confirmations. The most common one that is used in our lab and a lot of labs actually, is, is this point-to-point -point ablation for radiofrequency ablation. And so you imagine we uh, kind of go around the openings of the veins and you can see these white lesions here uh, represent sort of the, the, the tissue characteristic that results from burning the tissue focally. And again, we want those, those burns to actually consolidate and form into scar tissue because it's electrically inexcitable. Um, the concept behind that, as well as use of cryothermal abrasion, so instead of heating energy, freezing energies to really, really freezing to minus 80 degrees Celsius, technically. So the concept is that you either very, uh, very highly heat or cool the tissue that is in direct contact with other, whatever, whatever you are delivering the energy to. And then with the concept of thermal conduction, then that heat or cold is then distributed to deeper levels of cells. And then what happens is there's a critical threshold of temperature beyond which cell death occurs. And so we, we try to achieve that in order to then allow then subsequent fibrosis to form. There is newer energy technology called electro, irreversible, irreversible electroporation or pulsed field ablation, which is a little bit more elegant in its design actually. So this is kind of like, you know, you kind of, telling the cells to do, um, you're, you're, you're kind, of, um, kind of beating the cells up a bit. In this case here, you're, you're kind of convincing the cells that they just need to, you know, kind of in a focused manner, you know, stop doing their job. And it actually induces apoptosis. So it's this, it's this concept of applying intermittent high intensity electrical impulses to create this electrical field across the cell membrane. And this creates little, little tiny pores you know, nanometer sized pores in the cell membrane. 
And that action, if it's irreversible, then leads to then cell apoptosis. This is an evolving technology that is actually on the forefront of what is being studied in ablation right now and uh, will likely be utilized much more clinically, including at our center in very soon years to come. Now, I wanted to talk a bit about the uh, you know, innovation that has occurred here on site. Um, so there, I mentioned that we use radiofrequency ablation. Um, this is just kind of an example of how a lesion forms. So remember, this is electrical current. Current is delivered to the tissue and that creates a burn. And then you get a lesion that forms as a result of it. Now, this high temperature that results when you're delivering energy in that fashion can um, actually lead to clots forming on the catheter surface, which then makes it harder to deliver electrical energy into the muscle and limits the size of the lesion. Um, Will Sauer and Dewey Wynn and uh, some of the rest of us uh, sort of started this, started to investigate this concept of, you know, when we try to prevent that clot formation, we are infusing normal saline through the tip of the catheter that helps to cool this electrode so that when it gets really, really hot here at the tip tissue interface, clot and coagulum and things like that due to red blood cell denaturation don't occur. Um, but the problem is that normal saline has a charge and relatively speaking, it's um, a lower impedance environment compared to the muscle. So electrical current, just like a lot of things, goes the path of least resistance. And so we found that actually some of this energy that we were using to try to ablate tissue was being dispersed into the cooling environment around it. By reducing the amount of charge, reducing the amount of um, these ions that were contained in the bath around it, we actually were able to deliver more energy to tissue and create larger lesions. This becomes more relevant when we talk about ablating things like ventricular arrhythmias, because the muscle there is obviously much thicker. And in preclinical work, we showed clearly that the lesions that were produced with just the normal way that we were doing it, normal saline irrigation, compared to half normal saline, were much smaller. We applied this in clinical experience and with friends across the country and the world, we actually utilize this in a series of patients who've kind of failed the standard way of ablation in really tricky to reach spots in the ventricle. And what we found is that patients in whom we use this approach of using the half normal saline irrigation during ablation, that patients did better in terms of subsequent follow-up. Switching gears a little bit, because you know, a radiofrequency ablation isn't the only energy form that we use, and not all patients can undergo an ablation for various reasons. We have actually realized that we can kind of go back to the way that a, you know, invasive therapies were done in the first place for control of arrhythmias in the operating room, but we can do it with use of our contemporary mapping tools. I mentioned that you know we can see with our ablation and mapping equipment in some ways better than the surgeons can see because we can actually see this, the electrical activation. So we, we utilized this knowledge to take our mapping systems into the OR for selected cases, patients who, had, who were either anticipating another cardiac surgery or had failed multiple ablations or just did not have the capacity to undergo feasibly another endocardial or epicardial uh, catheter ablation. And so you can see here, this is the electroanatomic map here in the background. This is again, a team. So we've got surgical technician, surgeon here, EP lab nurse. We've got the device programmer here. We've got the fellow here. This is now an old slide. This is Dr. Zipsy, who is now our fellowship director now. Um, but he's mapping the outside of the heart, just like we would in the EP lab, but with lateral thoracotomy access provided by the surgeon. We're able to, using this combination of tools, so the surgeons achieve you know, our access to the heart, we map as though we're in the EP lab, we stimulate as though we're in the EP lab, except that we can actually see the heart beating when we're doing it. We can map during VT, and we can also do things like pacing to try to see where the most critical elements of the circuit are. Before then, we ablate. And you'll see that as we apply ablation that, um, that basically towards the end here, we get termination of ventricular arrhythmia. So we did a series of patients. Uh, we, we have a, 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 an experience from a series of patients like this that we studied. And Megan Kunkel, who actually started off as a first year med student here, now is going to be a pediatrics resident at the, the Children's Hospital in, at the University of Colorado. So she wrote this series up with me. Uh, looking at the longer-term follow-up from patients in whom we treated in this fashion and found 
uh, that we really could achieve good arrhythmia control, even in these patients for whom kind of multiple other procedures had been performed and failed. Um, I think that this is a very new and exciting area of treatment. This concept of, in terms of bailout therapies, uh, trying to get at arrhythmogenic substrate in the heart without necessarily doing anything invasive. So the first case report or case series of this was from the group and, and, and this subsequent phase one and two trial um, was, is from the group from Washington University. And basically the concept here is, and actually I'll go back, um, we basically can create imaging, use imaging of the heart and identify where regions of scarring exist, ideally on cardiac MRI, can also be done with cardiac CT, and then marry those images to the system in which radiation therapy for cancer is actually delivered to selected organs and actually uh, map out regions where delivered focused cardiac radiation can be given in order to modify the substrate, just like we would in an invasive procedure. This in its first report was, was highly exciting because of the impact acutely. You can see it's only five patients. But you see this a similar treatment effect in terms of mar, um, significant decrease in arrhythmia burden within just a month after treatment in the majority of these patients and without need for anything invasive to actually have happened. And phase one and two work, they have similarly shown that post-treatment patients uh, have less VT for the most part than they did before the treatment. Um, this is something that's gonna become increasingly utilized. We are doing this as well at our center. We have partnered with the group at Washington University and there will be a randomized clinical control trial coming out examining the efficacy of this type of treatment compared to standard ablation in patients who have failed prior ablation. So very exciting stuff. And that is just my friends, the tip of the iceberg. Um, we have many multi-center clinical collaborations, both within our center and with other centers, clinical trials and ablation uh, for persistent atrial fibrillation, ICD implantation. I mentioned the new treatments for ventricular arrhythmias, emerging tools for mapping and ablation, exciting area I couldn't cover in the time that I have about tri translational research and especially genetics-based screening and therapies. Ryan Aliong, Michael Bristow, uh, Mike Rosenberg are, you know, kind of taking the lead in terms of the efforts that we have with respect to arrhythmia specific research in that area and a um, number of multiple national as well as international registries with which we participate um, and glean additional information to move the field forward. Um, you know, no, no great practice exists in isolation and, and we have just a tremendous team that works with us that I'm so grateful to have the support from. And, um, you know, they help us to help patients every day. With that, I will stop and entertain any questions. Uh, <clears throat> thanks very much, uh, Dr. Sal. That was um, really a comprehensive review. Uh, just a couple of questions here. Sure. <clears throat> Can you... Um, uh, describe in more in some detail the relationship of atrial size uh, dilation, either dilation or shrinkage, uh, uh, with uh, uh, the relationship to a, to the onset of atrial fibrillation. That's a great question. I I often use left atrial size, especially in someone that I'm seeing with a reasonably new diagnosis of atrial fibrillation, as a a sort of surrogate for how long this might've actually been going on. Because as mentioned during the talk, many times these symptoms can be subtle and not, not appreciated until, you know, many times in retrospect, it's, it's only uh, recognized. So um, if, left atrial, if left atrial enlargement in the absence of significant uh, mitral valve disease is seen in a person who has atrial fibrillation, that tells me that this has probably been happening in the background. Um, there's not necessarily a cutoff in size with respect to, um, determining whether or not a person is more likely to have persistent atrial fibrillation from paroxysmal, um, in the, in, in, in a definable time frame. but it definitely is a marker. And I didn't have time to go through this either, but there are a number of really nice imaging studies. Uh, the decaf study in decaf two, which just came out which showed that you can actually visualize these regions of atrial fibrosis as well as quantify the size just on cardiac MRI in various stages of atrial fibrillation. Uh, does the atrial size uh, precipitate 
the AFib or is it the result of the AFib, uh, a, a dilation being the result of the AFib? It's a great question. I think it's a combination. I think in the beginning, it's the AFib that causes the increase in left atrial size because of you know the fibrotic changes that occur. Then though, once that process start, it starts, it's this vicious cycle where um, one feeds into the other. And uh, similarly, does the same, is there a relationship to the dilation of the pulmonary veins with regard to the uh, site of origin of the uh, um, electrical currents? Um, uh, uh, I, I guess the answer is, or the question is, if the, if the, uh, if the veins dilate, is that the reason why they uh, uh, generate the arrhythmia? Great question. Not necessarily. In this case, size does not necessarily matter. Okay. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> one other question from me is uh, the, the relationship of the mortality differences with and without AFib were all that you showed us, were, were those all adjusted for the comorbidities of obstructive sleep apnea and obesity? Because obviously those independent of AFib are going to increase mortality. Yes, those were all um, multivariate analyses that were looked at. Um, one study uh, that I didn't have a chance to show, but like that may provide clues about why there may be a mortality benefit is that there's this concept that you can detect um, potentially reversible fibrosis in the ventricles of patients who have atrial fibrillation using mm. specific MRI techniques. And that that, that actually um, is a reversible process. So that may be a reason why we see improvements in mortality for patients who have effective AF control compared to those um, who undergo VT ablation and have effective VT control, for instance. Uh, we have a question from the audience uh, uh, that would be rephrased. Uh, uh, when in the transition from intermittent uh, AFib to permanent AFib, uh, uh, where in that transition would it be appropriate to refer somebody for further evaluation um, uh, or treatment? That is an excellent question. Um, and it's a little bit of a moving target. I would say as soon as it is detected, um, you shouldn't just ignore it. So you wouldn't necessarily need to refer like for a first time occurrence of atrial fibrillation, but you should start to think about it. And you know, start to talk to, about the patient to the patient about modalities down the road that could be implemented to help control AF when it eventually progresses, which it usually does in most people. So I'd say first time occurrence, um, if it's pretty self limited, you don't necessarily have to refer. However, we're happy to see these patients. Uh, <laughs> you know, so, so please, please do if, if there's any degree of. Um, uncertainty about how best to manage them, including with initiation of antiarrhythmic drugs. Another question that just came in is, is there a role for digoxin? Um, so in terms of first line treatment, I would say no, except in very selected patients, perhaps patients with heart failure for which digoxin could be helpful for other reasons beyond rate control. But I would say that it is not a first line therapy for most people who have atrial fibrillation. Good. All right. Well, uh, I don't have any more other, I don't have any other questions in the chat box. I've got uh, a few. Can I ask her Dr. Okay. a couple of questions? Yeah, sure. go. Hey, hey, Wendy, uh, first of all, great grand rounds. Thanks so much for that information, especially the myth busting around um, rate versus rhythm control, which is the era I grew up in, which is I oh, just give them yeah. a beta blocker. They'll be fine. Uh, it was very helpful. You mentioned briefly the Watchman device, and this has come up time and time again in mm -hmm. the hospital setting when we've got patients who, maybe can't tolerate anticoagulation or are hesitant to have more extreme things done. Tell us about the Watchman. When should we consider it? When should we not? That's a great question. Um, there can be, and I, I've seen it practiced, a slippery slope kind of phenomenon where you just think, hey, I don't want to be on a blood thinner. Can I, can I get a Watchman? You know, that's not the way that I'm practicing. And it's not to the spirit of what's recommended um, exactly. Now, the FDA did provide a lot of leeway in terms of what, what type of patients can be offered this type of treatment. I would say, um, you know, they have to, at a minimum, at least for, you know, CMS coverage to occur, have a CHADS VASC score of at least three um, or a hard CHADS, like the old school kind of algorithm of at least two. 
um, and they need to have some reason that they can't take uh, a blood thinner. Um, for me, that threshold is higher because, you know, if you look at the data closely, the, the Watchman and the left atrial appendage occlusion treatments are not superior to anticoagulation in terms of preventing the most common kind of stroke, which is ischemic. They are far superior in preventing hemorrhagic stroke, but that comprises a very small minority of the patients who have strokes overall. So I would say, you know, the, the slam dunk patients for me are those people who keep having ischemic strokes and have a high risk of hemorrhagic stroke or just a high risk of bleeding that has been demonstrated with a trial of anticoagulant in the past. So that is, you know, um, I, I know there's a practice, it happens all around us uh, where, you know, you've got someone who just has a very intense lifestyle in terms of habits, you know, uh, downhill skiing, you know, they like to rock climb by themselves, that kind of thing. And they would rather not be on a medication that could lead to, li lead to life threatening bleeding, understandable, if they have injury. Um, I don't necessarily, um, my threshold for implanting, um, watchmans in, in those patients is, is a bit higher than, than for the other group for which a more compelling reason for not being on an anticoagulant is present, but you know, there's, a, there are exceptions to every rule. So it sounds like the personalized decision, but a higher threshold is probably the wise way to go given the data that's available. I think so. Now that being said, you know, the newer version of the watchman certainly uh, seems to predispose to fewer leaks. So the issue is you have to have complete seal of the device within the left atrial appendage, ideally, because if you have a little leak and it exceeds a certain threshold, if a clot forms inside, it can still get out. And I have in fact had a patient who had that first generation device placed, who had a massive stroke two mm. years afterwards off of anticoagulation. So, you know, the newer device seems to um, account for that problem a little bit better and uh, seems, you know, it, it may be that the threshold for implanting that device is lower moving forward. And then there's the newer device, the amulet, which doesn't seem to have exactly that same issue. And just for clarification, then these are devices that you as an EP doc would place in or who puts these in typically? Oh, that's a good question too. This is, everything's a team with us. So it's, it's us as well as the interventional cardiologists and Akenda Sai is our, our kind of point person in the interventional cardiology world who um, we co-implant with basically. Okay. We have, we have a couple more, a couple more questions in the Q and A. Uh, what about the effectiveness of, of, of ablation in the setting of uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy? That's a great question. Uh, when you're talking about ablation of atrial fibrillation, the, uh, the outcomes are worse than for people who don't have it. Um, there, there's more recurrence and it's probably related to the fact that they already have predisposition to more atrial remodeling because of the hypertrophy and um, mitral regurgitation that can occur in that setting. That's one thing. And very commonly they'll have triggers that are non-pulmonary too, even when they're in the paroxysmal phase. So I think that that is another issue. Um, they, they definitely can be effectively managed with ablation, but, but certainly the outcomes are not as good as, you know, for someone who has paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, who doesn't have that when it comes to ventricular arrhythmias, it's a, um, I would say similar story. And it kind of depends on what type of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy it is. If it's something that involves a septum that is still thick, like you have scar tissue that is in the septum, that's always hard. And the outcomes there are much, much uh, good outcomes are harder to achieve that are durable anyway. If you're talking about a burned out hypertroph who has like apical scar or aneurysm, I'd say the, the results there, if we go to more advanced techniques, um, are actually not that much worse than, you know, for other garden variety types of VT and structural heart disease. Another question that came up is, <clears throat> is a curiosity about how external radiation can be delivered to a rather small area of the heart uh, while it's still beating. Is the radiation gated to, uh, to the heart rate? That's an excellent question. So it is not able to be effectively gated to heart rate right now. It's gated to respiration. So that's a, a limitation for sure. And it's also why, you know, like, um, you know, this, this, that first publication came out, I think in 2015 or 16. So it's been like quite some time that this has been out and available. We've treated a total of like 
two, two patients, three, three patients by now here at this center. And the reason is because, you know, this is a bailout strategy still. This is really for people who we feel can't tolerate another procedure. They, we believe that the substrate that we have to target is in a location that would be unsafe to target using our standard approach. Um, it's like a 25 gray fraction usually that's delivered. It's, it is very focused. So just like they do for cancer treatments of other involving actual cancer of other organs, you know, they contour very precisely where, where the, um, where the radiation is to be, to, to be delivered. It's much more complex because the heart is beating while they're doing this. And most of the other organs that they are delivering therapy to do not have that same, uh, right. fluctuation in position, but, um, so, so the short, I guess that was a long answer, but basically we probably deliver more, um, we cover more areas of the heart than actually are affected or involved in the arrhythmia circuit in doing so. Um, but we, we try to, with the, to the best of our ability, kind of minimize how much extra area is, is radiated in, in the process. Um, this is something that I think we'll be utilizing more and more um, as we are presented with increasingly sicker patients with ventricular arrhythmias. And I did also want to credit um, Dr. Brian Cavanaugh, who's the head of radiation oncology here, who has been critical in getting the program here off the ground with us. Wendy, if I could ask, you know, you mentioned OSA and obesity and the connection with AFib, and I think the word you used where it would be a disservice to treat one and not treat the others. Uh, maybe elaborate on some of the data behind improvement of OSA and obesity and how that impacts AFib. And this was asked actually by an audience member as well. Yeah, that, no, that's, that is a great question. I, um, you know, I cut out a lot of slides cause I was worried I was showing too much information, <laughs> but, um, well, that's so, good. We have time uh, to talk about it now, which is great. That's right. It's perfect. So, um, so Prash Sanders is in Australia. He has done probably the most comprehensive work with respect to overweight status and impact of AFib treatments. And he's done it in a couple of ways, one with a prospective observational study, one with an actual randomized trial. And for people who are, it, so it's not just enough to tell people they have to lose weight. So what he did was actually like an interventional like weight loss program. So patients came every week, they got prescribed it. I think they got at an actual um, supply of food or a, at least a list of food items that they could eat and how much. So they were very attentively you know, monitored in terms of their diet. And they were instructed to exercise a certain amount. And, and then the others were just told, you know, you got to lose weight and, you know, just do it however you think, you know, that you can do it. And so a couple of things came out, um, even just a little bit of weight loss that was sustained was enough to improve the amount of atrial fibrillation that these patients were having. That was one. And in that randomized trial where he randomized to the very intensive uh, diet regimen versus not. Um, clearly the people who were in the, the intervention arm did better. Their overall burden of atrial fibrillation on subsequent monitoring decreased, their functional status improved, et cetera. And then uh, the final thing with that is that um, the people who lost weight really, really quickly, but then gained it back, they lost all the benefit of the weight loss that they initially had. So you got to be in it to win it. And like, you know, slow and steady is, is, is appropriate here. Um, you got to start on a regimen that can be sustainable. The OSA data, there are also trials that have looked at that in people who have sleep apnea and are either treated with CPAP or not. And what one study by Elad Anter's group, when he was at the um, Beth Israel group, um, Beth Israel De Deaconess Hospital showed is that patients who were effectively treated with CPAP did the same as people who didn't have sleep apnea, but were undergoing PVI. People who had OSA treated with, not treated with CPAP, but also who underwent ablation, the standard type of ablation, had just as bad of outcomes as people who didn't undergo ablation at all. And so, you know, that's, that's the data. And PVI is pulmonary vein isolation. Pulmonary vein isolation. Sorry. Okay. Yes. Good. Yeah. That's very helpful. Thank you. Yeah. So, so you're ba I, I think you're saying that if you have AFib in the setting of OSA, you need to treat both separately. Is correct. That correct. Yeah. 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 All right. When do we have time for me? One more question. And this is one that I deal with a lot in the hospital, which is what do you, what's the optimal treatment pathway for somebody who has AFib in the hospital, but for whatever reason, can't get any coagulation. And it's a new diagnosis and maybe break it down for me. Like, you know, they're symptomatic from it, mm -hmm. but in one scenario, they're rate controlled. 
and in one they're not rate controlled. How do you manage that um, yeah. from a sort of a guidance perspective? Yeah, the, the can't be anticoagulated part is the hardest. I mean, rate control, um, I mean, you kind of just have to, a little bit, you have to cross your fingers. I mean, we're, we're not implanting left atrial appendage occlusion devices in these patients acutely, you know. Um, with respect to um, rhythm control, if they have been in it for less than 24 hours, I feel pretty safe cardioverting those patients um, and yeah, not worrying the, about... Is that without, right, right? without anticoagulating, unless okay. they have like some really high risk features, like they've had a prior stroke, then of course you worry more about doing that, but you could still potentially get away with it. If you just verify that they don't have a clot already at baseline, um, that's a little bit controversial, but, but that's kind of how I manage it. So you're all, all about electricity. <laughs> well, you know that, what though? The electricity shocking. drives the beating of the heart. <laughs> it, it would be shocking if she were not. <laughs> all right. Well, but Dr. Zell, I want to thank you yeah. for grand rounds. I think the quote that I'm going to take away from it, this is uh, you have to be in it to win it. I, I think that was very powerful. Uh, thank you for educating all of us. And thank you, Dr. Albert, for, for moderating. Sure. All right. Thanks, everybody. Thank See you all you for the opportunity. See you next Thanks. week. Okay. See you, Wendy. Bye.